I'm very interested in the problem of cell motility. And one of the reasons I'm so interested in cell motility is it's an absolutely critical part of cancer invasion and metastasis. In addition to being involved in, in cancer, though, we, cell migration is with us from birth to death. And so even before we're born, cells in the embryo have to migrate, sometimes quite long distances on their length scale, to arrive at the proper place to form the organs and tissues that make us us. And in actually some cases, we think some of the developmental cell migration events are sort of reoccurring during, during cancer. These, some of the same programs of genes and proteins that come on uh, during the cancer process are reawakening old things that, that normally happen properly during development but now are, have gone awry. In addition to these kinds of things, cell motility is really critical for brain development. And so in, in, the, in the human brain, there are roughly a trillion neuronal connections. That's a greater number than there, than there are stars in the known universe. Every single one of those neuronal connections actually arises due to an event of cell motility. So neurons send out processes that make contacts with either other neurons or other types of cells, and those, those contacts are either maintained over sometimes the course of our entire lives, and sometimes for only transient periods of time. And it's thought that the network of connections that forms during development really forms the basis of our behavior and, and even higher order processes such as consciousness. So in order to understand so, such a key central uh, biological problem, we sort of have to break it down into distinct steps so that we can understand, uh, we can make some sense of it. And so one of the models that's been used for many years and is used in my lab is to understand simple cells crawling around uh, in dishes uh, that we can make uh, movies of on the microscope. And so if we do that, and we watch those movies, we can begin to understand motility. And what seems to happen, what, what happens is we can begin to break up the process into steps, discrete steps. So if you were to strip off that membrane and look at what's underneath, you'd see this amazing network of protein filaments. These protein filaments are made of a protein called actin. Back to that theme of muscle being sort of the basis on which we understand some of this, actin and myosin are the two major proteins in our muscle, but it turns out actin and myosin are found in every cell in our body. And in fact, they're arranged in this really remarkable pattern. It's a branching pattern called a dendritic uh, meshwork. This is a really remarkable pattern that occurs again and again in nature, just like the branching of a shrub or a tree or even a river. That same pattern is found inside of every single one of our uh, cells of our body. The proteins that I work on are called the coronins. They originally identified in a forest amoeba called Dictyostelium. This is an amoeba that lives in the leaf mold of the forest. It was actually discovered right here in the state of North Carolina by a, a Princeton biologist back in the 40s. And it's been really used as a model to understand how cells crawl around. And that's where coronin was originally found. The, the name coronin actually is Latin for crown. And these, uh, it was named for the structures that form on these dictyostelium amoeba. They looked like crowns to the people that first found them. <clears throat> it was actually one of the first proteins that was ever tagged with this so-called green fluorescent protein, which was identified from jellyfish that was awarded the Nobel Prize a few years back. This has been a remarkable breakthrough in our understanding of how proteins work inside of cells because we can make proteins, individual proteins inside of cells become fluorescent, meaning they glow in the dark, and we can watch them in, in, with the microscope and study how they work together. Coronin was actually one of the very first proteins ever tagged or fused to this green fluorescent protein. My lab really focuses on this one particular one, which is actually found everywhere in every cell in our body. It's called coronin 1b. That's how we know it. And when we look at the localization inside of cells of this protein, coronal 1b, it's localized in a band that corresponds to that area of branching actin, the dendritic meshwork. And we actually see other proteins that we already knew were there. And it turns out that one of the things that my lab discovered is that you'll notice in this micrograph that the red, when you merge the two images together of coronin and cortactin, this other marker, they're colored with red and green respectively. In the merged image, you can see there's a little band of red that extends out a little bit further than the coronin does. 
It turns out we should have been paying more pen attention to that. It took us a couple years to really get it, that this is an important fact. And it turns out that cortactin is a protein that affects the formation of these branches, and coronin is a protein that helps take them apart. So it makes sense that the red band would be a little further out where the branches are being born, and the green band for coronin would be sort of tilted further back in the sequence. That's what I mean about the arrangement in space is really a representation and a snapshot of what's happening in, a, in time. So this green fluorescent protein I was talking about uh, allows us to, in real time, see what's going on with individual proteins inside of living cells. You can imagine this has just changed our view of how cells work from sort of static images, single snapshots, to really being able to sense the dynamics. And so this is that protein, coronin-1b, fused to green fluorescent protein, and now we can make a movie of it, and we can see where it is over time. And we can get the, the idea that it really is located out here in this band of actin. And if you look closely here, you can actually see there's sort of a cascading waterfall effect. So that's where the actin is being born at the front and being pushed backwards into the middle part of the cell. This is a process called retrograde actin flow. And this is an important uh, property that we can study for this network.